Our presenter today, we're going to be learning about keeping West Virginia wildlife, um, and this is Ashley Anderson. Ashley Anderson is an environmental educator with the Division of Natural Resources, or DNR. She has always been interested in the outdoors and wildlife, but never found her calling for it until she was a sophomore in college when she discovered the Natural Resource and Recreation Management Program. After graduating from Marshall University with her bachelor's degree and minor in biology, Ugh, biological sciences, sorry about that. She pursued an internship with the DNR where she has stayed since. She loves working with students and animals alike and believes in hands-on learning environments where students get to explore and discover. Ashley currently works in education, assisting in research studies, event planning, NAS, NASP, um, and Birathon, and acts as a liaison between the DNR and the Forks of Coal Foundation for the new construction of the Claudia L. Workman Wildlife Education Center, which is gonna be really nice. So Ashley, thanks for presenting today and I'll turn it over to you. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and I need to make sure I share sound, share. All right, can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So we've got a small group today, but hopefully you guys will be super interactive, I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I will be um, monitoring the chat. That's how I expect uh, you guys to answer me and talk back and forth. You're more than welcome to ask any questions at any time during um, the presentation. Either come off mute or type in the chat. Either way, I will be monitoring both. Um, so let's go ahead and dig in and learn a little bit about me. Um, so my name is Ashley Anderson and I work for the Division of Natural Resources. Um, so this is me uh, holding a bobcat. You can't just go out and hold wild bobcat. This is a domestic, a wild, it's, it's wildlife. Wildlife is still wild, but it's one of our most domesticated uh, bobcats that we have in a facility. She's been separated from all other bobcats um, for quite a long time. She broke her leg and has been in quarantine for a while. Um, she plans on going back soon, which she'll probably get more of her wild characteristics after this, but I had to nab the picture while I could. Um, so a little bit about what I do for environmental education. Um, so I do outdoor classrooms. Um, I'll go to schools. Um, sometimes they'll plan indoor or outdoor classrooms, but either way, I still call them outdoor because I like to bring that in the outdoors indoors when I can. Um, I'll do summer camps like this, but hopefully not exactly like this where we can be more in person next year because um, I do like to be super hands on. Um, I also do Envirathon, which is a test for high school students that can win um, money prize for scholarships for school, or they can even put that money toward, towards a car for college if they want. Um, we don't monitor the money. So if you need it for textbooks, if you need it for gas to commute to school, um, whatever you need that for, you can use that. It's a great competition. Um, I also help plan events like National Hunting and Fishing Day. I also work with the NASP program. It's an archery in the schools program, and I am an archery instructor as well. We plan the state tournament. Um, I act as a liaison, which basically that means I'm the middleman between the DNR and the Forks of Coal Foundation um, for the new wildlife education center that's going out in Alum Creek. Um, so it's a little bit past quarter G. Um, we also have two programs that are coming back very soon. Um, it's Project Wild, which is K through 12 and Becoming an Outdoors Woman, um, which is gonna be centered for uh, women above the age of 18, but all will be welcome. Um, I also do lots of little um, committees and like little projects like the Mountain State Arts and Craft Fair in Ripley, um, license plates, um, it basically any type of committee that can be on here. I end up on. <laughs> so a little bit about the research study. So since I'm an environmental educator, the best way for me to educate the public is for me to go out and do it. Um, whenever someone tells me something, I can relay that message as best as I can. But when I go out and I experience things, then I can give a better representation to the public about what it is the DNR does. So they're really good about letting me basically do anything and everything that the research uh, biologists do. So we have wildlife biologists and we have fish biologists. Um, 
So I've done things like electroshock fishing, which is where we go on boats and we take these big metal like jellyfish looking things and we drop them in the water and it sends out an electrical current um, every couple of seconds and it stuns the fish. It doesn't hurt them. It stuns them. So they basically just float up to the water and like to the top of the water and they're just kind of like, why can't I move? And we just scoop them up in a net and put them in a live well. Um, and then once we've got a good amount of fish, we'll take them out individually, take their length, take their weight, take a picture, tag them, send them back. Um, sometimes we'll do this with a specific type of fish. Sometimes we'll just do it as a whole. Um, sometimes we just need to fill a fish tank for an event and the fish will be fine and they'll be returned to normal. Um, I've done invasive species extraction, like the Asian carp. Um, I've done necropsies. Um, and that's basically where you go and you dissect something. Um, so I've done bear and deer. So you'll just go through and you will um, look through all the organs, all the body parts, just make sure that the animal doesn't have any parasites or diseases that is affecting um, the population of deer. We do spotlight surveys just to see how many deer there are in the state. And we'll, we used uh, an estimation um, for each county. Um, I've done goose banding, I've done cave research, I've done rehabilitation, trapping, but one of my favorite things that I've been able to do has been because of COVID. So one good thing did come of COVID. Um, I got to work at the West Virginia State Wildlife Center. Uh, we got to maintain enclosures. My favorite was feeding the animals. Um, we got to do facility maintenance, which is a fancy way of saying I got to mow and weed eat, wash and clean toilets. Um, I also got to uh, do medicine application for animals. We have um, two mountain lions named Lewis and Clark, um, but Clark has bad blood pressure and he needs eye drops every morning. So I got to do that. I also got to try to take a mountain lion's blood pressure, which was not the easiest. You have to get the little blood pressure cuff over the base of his tail and try to keep him real still. Uh, so we have to try to get him in the gate, a gated area, and try to just kind of feed him snacks so he'll stay still. Um, we've had to do nuisance animal removal and then try to rehabilitate them um, into our exhibits. Um, we've had to do trapping. It's one of my favorite experiences I've ever had. So a little bit about our program. Um, we're going to be talking about mammals today. And today, right now, we're going to be talking about different foxes. So we have two different fox species here in West Virginia. We've got the red fox and we've got the gray fox. Now the red fox is bigger. It'll be about 15 to 20 pounds. Sometimes they, rec they record up to about 30, but they like to stay around in the 20s. Um, gray foxes will only be about 10, 10-ish. Um, red foxes, it's not going to be uncommon to see them in your neighborhood at night. They are nocturnal. They are scavengers. They will dig through your trash. Um, they will have about one to 10 kits through March to May, um, whereas the gray fox is only going to have three to four kits and they're super wooded creatures. So what that means is they're going to stay in the woods far away from people. They don't like people. Um, red foxes are skittish too. They won't approach you. They'll run away. But gray foxes, they won't even come near you. Um, you'll never really see them out in the neighborhood, especially at night. Um, the only instance I've ever even seen one is at Pipesnim State Park Resort. Um, people were feeding two gray fox pups from the balcony. Um, they were throwing food off and they're so young, like they're learning these habits of getting food. And it's right across, like right on the ridge line of a huge vast forest. Um, so that isn't uncommon. Um, but we want to make sure that we stay away from feeding wildlife because it does take away their natural instinct uh, to hunt after their own, especially when they're so young. So we're going to talk a little bit, there, there it is, about adaptate, adaptations. So adaptations is going to be some type of physical characteristic or trait that it has adapted over the years to help it survive and thrive. So we're going to talk a little bit about some, and here are some examples. So camouflage is going to be an adaptation. So here we can see um, we've got an owl in a tree. We've got this little chameleon blending in. We've got this moth down here, 
And then we've got a copper head up here as well. So you can see each of these are using their ability, their adaptation to completely try to blend in with their surroundings. Now, because we're looking for them, we can see them. If we were just hiking through the woods um, and not really paying attention, or I guess in Miami or somewhere really down south walking on the pavement, um, you might not see these guys um, right off this, the bat. You're going to have to be looking for them. And that's their purpose is if something's just moving by, they can stand still and hopefully it'll keep on moving. So another adaptation is going to be shells or some type of hard covering for them. This helps protect them against predators. So turtles have shells, snails have, sh snails have shells, <laughs> uh, mollusks have shells, armadillos are going to have that shell. Um, these are all ways hardened structures that are going to protect them from uh, their predators. Um, so this is going to be another ad adaptation that we have. So here's water storage. So this is where we're going to start using the chat more. So you guys have heard me talk. All right, where is the water stored in this tree picture? So water storage is an adaptation. So where is the water going to be stored in this tree? I got all day. Well, actually till 12, but so. Do you guys think the water is stored in the tree over here in the sky? Is it stored? The roots, yeah. So um, that rain is going to fall. It's going to be absorbed into the roots. Where does it go after the roots? The trunk, yes, Miss Susan, thank you. And it's gonna go out through the branches and then what's at the end of the branches? They fall off, yeah, leaves. So all that water is gonna be stored throughout this tree. Um, when it's through the trunk, it acts as a uh, highway almost for the water, all right? So here's another one. Here's a desert plant. It's a cactus. Um, I don't know the exact species of cactus, um, but it has a wide base to keep any water in there. It's got um, like little short prickly stems coming off to protect it from any type of predator that will be after the cactus's water or the cacti's water. And then um, that's going to be all stored in there. Now here's a question. Yes, and it does, it, leave, it exits the leaves through trans, transpiration. Um, where is um, the water stored in the camel? Where's the water stored in this camel? Where's the camel store its water? Hump, I'm so glad you said hump. It's actually not the hump. And I like asking this question because it's a trick question. So I, I was wanting you to say humpy life. Um, so yes, this animal, the camel, has an adaptation of storing water. He can drink up to 30 gallons of water at a time and go almost a week without drinking. But that water isn't stored in the hump. The hump actually contains fat and it breaks down the nutrients to provide it to with nutrients for weeks. Um, that water actually is stored in the blood cells and they are super elastic and they're oval shaped so that um, all that water is actually gonna be stored in the blood cells. Um, so that's a little fun fact. A lot of people think that water is stored in the hump but that's actually fat and then the water is stored in the blood cells. So that's a little bit about some examples about adaptations. And now I'm going to ask you guys, what are some adaptations about this fox that you guys see? There's quite a few. And they're not as hard as blood cells. Oh, 
Okay, let's let's work our, our way from the top to the bottom of this little guy. What's up here? Ears, yes. So he can move those ears independently of one another. He does have really good sense of hearing. Um, so if I'm looking at the computer, put my little fox ears up. If I'm looking at the computer and I hear something, oops, my thumb over there, I can turn just one ear. So I can move them independently of one another, just like your dog or cat. If we work our way down from there, we've got eyes. They have a really, really good sense of eyesight. They, uh, they're nocturnal, so they can see well at night. Also here, we got this little sniffer right here. Um, so that elongated nose actually kind of tells us about their sense of smell. Since they have a long snout, um, that actually means they have a really good sense of smell. So shorter, uh, shorter snouts mean they don't have as good of a sense of smell as things with longer snouts. So we can tell just by the length of his nose that he has a good sense of smell, which happens with all canines. Um, they have a really good sense, well, I should say all natural canines because um, some dogs have been bred so much over the years for shorter snouts that they don't have a good sense of smell anymore. And one that comes to mind specifically is the pug. Um, the pug has a lot of breathing problems because it's been bred so much to have that short snout. Um, another thing working our way down is going to be the mouth. Um, so they are an omnivore. They eat plants and meat. Um, mainly their diet is meat. Um, they're going to eat small mammals like um, uh, rodents, rabbits, but they're also going to supplement with um, some vegetation like berries and fruits when they can't get the meat that they need. Um, so another thing is going to be its fur. It is kind of camouflage, especially in the fall when um, all that leaf litter is on the ground. It's going to blend in. Um, we also got long legs. So these long legs, and he actually has a really short stomach, or a really short stomach, a really small stomach. This helps keep his meals light. Um, with both of these in combination with one another, he can run up to 30 miles an hour. So he will get a speeding ticket in the school zone. This tail, this real fluffy tail with the white tip, that um, actually helps keep him balanced. So if you guys have ever seen those videos of cheetahs running, um, they can run up to 60 miles an hour and they have a really, really good example of using that tail to help keep them out. So while they're running and then they cut corners real fast, they'll flip that tail over to help counteract that balance and then they won't fall over when they cut corners. Um, all animals that have tails, the reason they do is because it helps keep them balanced when they're running or moving or jumping. Um, so they use that to kind of counteract their body weight, whichever way they move. All right. So here's a little bit about their coats as well. So they have two sets of fur. They have the primary guard hair, which you guys can see right here. And then they have the secondary undercoat hair. Um, so this says dog, but this actually goes for all animals that have an undercoat, which otters, beavers do, um, not just canines. Um, so in the warm weather, that um, undercoat is going to shed. So as you guys can see, it's not as thick here. Um, when you get down here into cold weather, you can see that thickness of the undercoat um, gets more dense. Um, so this helps trap cool air up against the skin because um, it is thinned out, but then sun rays are going to be reflected uh, by the top hair and it allows for the body heat to escape, but it also allows a cool breeze to come through. So this is why they don't recommend shaving your dogs completely um, that have an undercoat is because, well, when this is shaved completely, so pretend this is shaved off right here, all of it those sun rays are gonna go straight to the skin or whatever little teeny tiny short hairs are there. They're probably gonna get sunburned. They'll overheat because the secondary undercoat isn't here to keep a cool breeze in. And body heat can escape, but that sun is gonna severely give them a body, uh, a sunburn. So the top coat is water resistant. 
Um, this goes with um, all uh, aquatic mammals as well, like beaver and otters. They will have a waxy feel to their fur as well because they produce an oil in their skin that helps coat that top coat, which helps really make them like slick and water resistant as well. So here's a little bit about um, the snout, um, or I'm sorry, about the skull of the red fox and the gray fox. Um, so the Latin name for the red fox is Volfis Volfis. And the reason I remember that, that's the only Latin name I remember. Um, the reason I remember that is because the red fox is going to have a V shaped on the skull. So here you can kind of see the red fox skull is bigger than the gray fox. But if you find a skull out in the woods and it looks like a fox skull, but you don't have another one to compare, you, it's close in size, so you might get confused. Um, but there are some other differences. This V shape is the biggest one. Um, the V shape will be the red fox. The U shape here is going to be the gray fox. And that's how you can tell the difference between the two. Also, take a look at that snout. We got the long snout. So we can assume that the red fox has a better sense of smell than the gray fox because it has that longer snout. So here's a little bit about nasal passages as well. Um, here we've got the red fox. Uh, this is a red fox skull and you can see the length is a snout. But over here, you've got this one. Does anybody have any guesses as um, why this has a short, or I'm sorry, what animal this is? Does anybody know what animal this is? or have a guess. We know it doesn't have as good of a sense of smell as this canine. Does anybody have a guess? It's got sharp canines. It's got sharp molars. So it's probably going to be a carnivore. So we've got a carnivore with a short snout. It's not a bear. Anybody got a guess? Another guess? If not, it's okay. Skulls can be hard sometimes. So this is actually a mountain lion skull. So mountain lions don't have as good of a sense of smell as our red fox over here, and they are true carnivores. Um, we'll get into teeth here in a second, so I won't dig too deep into them, but you guys can kind of see the difference between the two. Cats, felines, won't have as good of a sense of smell as canines. So you guys can kind of tell the snouts between the two of them um, just based on this. Now, once again, when you get into selective breeding for dogs, if you were to stumble upon a dog skull um, and just basing it off snout size, you might want to instantly say, oh, that's a feline skull. Um, probably not. There's going to be other characteristics that uh, differentiate between the two, but... Um, snout size is a good indicator of sense of smell. So here we go, my interactive group. Um, we are going to be messaging a lot in this one, or talking. All right, so we discussed that this was a fox. What type of fox did we say this was? It's a color of the rainbow. Red fox. Yes, red fox. Thank you. I don't even know who that was, but thank you. So, all right, that was the red fox. What was this one? Gray fox. Yes, the gray fox. All right. What are some differences that you guys see between the two? Um, they're both two different colors. Yeah, exactly. One's red, one's gray. That is one of the biggest differences. Their snout, yeah. So one has a longer snout uh, than the other that we saw. Um, this one also, the red fox, has more of a canine look to his face, whereas a lot of people describe the gray fox as having more cat-like features. But um, both are actually canines, and the gray fox is the only canine that can climb as well. So what's another difference? What's something that you guys see about the tail? Mm 
It's not a trick question. One has a bushier one. Yeah, so one's fur is fluffier and bushier than the other one. Um, the tail of the red fox is a lot bushier. The gray fox kind of has that slim coat. Um, red foxes are actually known for their fur. It was not a, it, it was a big deal if a woman in the 1930s and 40s had a red fox scarf or even a mink like scarf. Um, they were super fancy if they had one, super high class. Um, and it's because they were, the foxes were so soft and warm, like it was ideal to have one for any type of fancy get together. The red fox is also going to have the white tip tail, so keep that in mind. Um, the gray fox is going to have a black stripe down it and a black tip. So keep that in mind while I ask you some next questions. So yes. Um, that was not a big hint at all for the trick, trick questions I am going to have. Um, what type of fox is this? Any guesses? I don't want to just give it to you. I want to make you work for it. Well, we see that he is a different color than any of the other ones that we saw, but there are some similarities. It's a fox. It is a fox. I get hyena, I get coyote, I get wolf a lot, but this is a type of fox. A black fox. I get that one all the time. You would think, because we've got the red fox and the gray fox, they all go on colors. But this is actually a red fox, even though there's not a hint of red on it. The reason for this that we know is it's still got that white tip tail. So red foxes come in different colors. They're called color morphs. It's just a fancy scientific way of saying they come in different colors, just like us. Same species of fox, different color humans. Different color or same species fox, different color foxes. Um, so this is actually gonna be, it's nicknamed the silver fox because it has no lick of red on it. Um, but it's still the species of red fox. All right, so we've got the red fox. We've got the gray fox. We have a, a what's this one? What's this one you guys think? It's still a fox. What's the color of the tip of the tail? White fox. So I get that one a lot too. When I ask this question, I ask the tip of the tail question and I get white fox all the time. This is actually still a red fox. Um, so even though it's got red and black on it, it's still got that white tip tail. And so it's gonna be a red fox as well. Um, so right here, we can see all the different color morphs of the red fox. So it's just gonna be different colors of the same species. So the only color morph that we have here in West Virginia is gonna be the standard red of the red fox. And then um, we've got the cross fox and we've got the silver fox, all same species, all have the white tip tail, just different colors. Um, so we're gonna move on. Do you guys think that foxes hibernate? No. No, that is correct. They do not hibernate. What animals do hibernate? So bears are a little bit yes and no. And I, I have some slides on that one, but I get bears a lot because that's what we standardly teach in schools is bears hibernate. And they technically do a form of hibernation. Um, no large mammals actually truly hibernate. So we've got a few true hibernators. So here's some, we've got bees that truly hibernate and truly, true hibernation is gonna be, you go to sleep at the beginning, you don't wake up till the end. Um, we've got garter snakes or any other type of snakes. We've got frogs, this is a wood frog. Um, here's a Virginia big-eared bat, but most bats hibernate. 
here in West Virginia. Um, we have some migratory, migratory bat um, that are gonna fly south for the winter. Um, skunks will hibernate, groundhogs, squirrels, things like that, um, smaller mammals. Um, bears, on the other hand, are going to do something called torpor. So there's a difference between torpor and true hibernation. Um, we have, so for true hibernation, their body temperature is going to get lower than 40 degrees. That's almost freezing. 32 degrees is freezing. Um, and not like it, it's literally I, like water will start to freeze at 32 degrees. It's not like it's just, oh, super cold. Um, they are gonna have a longer wake up period because they've got to bring their body temperature up before they can truly wake up. During torpor, their body temperature only drops 20 degrees. Um, it's gonna go a little bit above 88. Um, so they're gonna wake up fast. They're gonna wake up if you, They'll wake up throughout the winter as well, um, the, especially black bear. Uh, they will have uh, their uh, cubs while they're sleeping. And so they'll wake up just to kind of check on them to make sure they're still there, that they're eating, that they're safe. Um, both of them will, their metabolism will slow and their heart rate, heart rate slows. Um, during torpor, they don't need, um, have a reason that they need to eat or pass waste or anything because they have bulked up for this reason. Um, they will use um, their muscle and their organ tissue to break down all the proteins their body needs. Um, they also will use the fat and break that down into water and calories to burn. Um, now that goes for the same for true hibernation as well. But the biggest difference is true hibernators won't wake up throughout winter, whereas torpor, they'll still wake up. No large mammal truly gets to true hibernation. Um, they won't drop their body temperature below 40 degrees. Um, they'll stay above the 88. Um, they will wake up throughout winter to check on everything. Um, so that is a little bit about some differences. Now we do teach in schools that both of these kind of fall under hibernation. So true hibernation and torpor will both fall in, under. So here's a little bit about some bears. So we've only got one of these in the state. We've only got the, got the black bear. We have about 14,000 in the state. Um, they can get a little over, they can get 600 pounds. Um, the largest that we have on record is named Jack. Um, he is taxidermied at our state wildlife center. I believe he was around 680. Um, so they will start topping out around then, but that does not mean that you won't get the, the way outlier of maybe a 700 pound black bear. Um, there are a lot of black bear in the state. Um, we don't tag every single 14,000 of them. Um, so it's not abnormal to get a couple of outliers here and there. They will stand about five to seven feet tall. Um, and then we can kind of compare this for size. This is the brown bear. This is a Kodiak bear, um, a special type of brown bear that are known for being really large. Um, the island that they're on will actually run a Facebook group page where they'll guess the weight, um, or I'm sorry, they will guess which bear will get the heaviest, and it's like a big contest, and um, they will get above 1,500, oh, sorry, 1,500 pounds and stand eight to 10 feet tall, um, so when that's in comparison to the black bear, you might not think that's that big, but that's probably taller than your ceilings at your house is how tall they stand. So they probably hit, hit their head easily in your house. Um, I think standard ceilings are eight feet tall, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so he, he will be going through your ceiling. Um, polar bears, they can get up to 1,700 pounds. Um, I've seen lots of variations on this. I've seen some that say that polar bears get 1,200 pounds, but then I've seen world records go to 1,800 pounds. Um, so there is kind of a variety in all of these, um, but they will stand about 10 to 12 feet tall. So that kind of shows you how small our black bear is in comparison with other bears. Um, and here we can see the different color morphs of the black bear. So these are all black bears even though they might not be black. Their species is still the black bear. Um, so here we see the different color morphs again. This is not all of them. 
Um, the black bear actually has the most color morphs out of any mammal. Um, we can see the cinnamon state or the cinnamon color morph, the blonde, the gray blue, which is in southern eastern, southeastern Alaska. There's also a white bear that's, that's, or it's a black bear, but it's a white color morph that people think um, is spiritually lucky and they call it a spirit bear. Um, so we have tons of different color morphs of these black bears. Um, so cubs are born at half a pound during the winter and they stay with the mom for about one and a half years um, until they're big enough to go out and find their own territory and survive on their own. So here we're gonna take a look at the teeth. Um, we have some canines, we've got some incisors, we got some molars. Um, what do you guys think? Yes, so these color morphs are a, um, it's based on genetics and it's gonna be based on region as well, just for the fact that um, when you're in a certain region, sometimes regions get isolated and populations will breed within one another because of limiting factors like mountains or rivers. Um, it just depends on the species and what that limiting factor is for um, that species of animal. Um, so um, like foxes, for example, um, out west, you'll have different uh, color morphs. Um, so usually if you have a lot of color morphs in one area, that's their local population and they'll breed with one another and then create more of that color morph. Whereas here, we don't have very many or at all of the silver fox color morph. So we won't see that here because only the red color morph of the red fox is breeding. So those genetics are gonna be passed on. It's a lot like um, eye color. So my mom's eyes are blue and my dad's were brown. Brown's the dominant trait, that's what I have. Me and my fiance, we both have brown eyes. So it's a dominant trait. So that trait will be passed on to our child. Um, so you get into genetics and um, dominant and recessive traits. Um, these color morphs are going to be along that line. So you can kind of find out more about those, but it is based on genetics. So moving back to teeth, what do you guys think this is the diet of this black bear? This is a black bear. Um, I may have mentioned it a little earlier what they ate, so we'll see. Yes. Nut varies in some meat. Um, they've got canines, they got incisors, incisors, they got these molars that are pretty flat. Um, these are gonna be for grinding and chewing uh, vegetation. These are gonna be for tearing. So yes, it eats both plants and meat, which means it is gonna be an omnivore. Um, here's a little bit, um, we've got herbivore, which is gonna be plants, omnivore is plants and meat, and then we've got carnivore, which is meat. Um, here we've got, um, Carnivores pictured um, like our feline up here. We got omnivores like the black bear and the coyote. Um, and we also, uh, these screech owls will actually eat um, meat as well. Um, small rodents. Uh, we actually feed, this is a picture from the wildlife center. We actually feed them deer meat uh, chunks and mice. So they will eat deer as well. Um, as they don't seem to be picky. So they are um, an uh, omnivore as well. So what do you guys think this one eats based on his teeth or her? I don't know if it's a male or female based on the skull. This is the skull that we saw earlier, or not the exact one, but it's a mountain lion skull. And I may have mentioned it earlier, what he eats. So he's not an omnivore, so it's a feline, and he's got canines, and he does have these molars, and they are going to be, um, you can tell that they're super sharp and they're pointy. Um, so he is gonna be a carnivore. He's only gonna eat meat. Um, so here we've got the red fox, which we discussed earlier. Um, they've got canines, they've got the sharp molars, they do have incisors up here, and then they have a couple, although small, um, minor uh, flatter molars. Um, they will eat meat majorly, but they will um, eat some fruits and veggies to supplement their diet as well. Um, I had it explained to me recently that um, being a carnivore, omnivore, and herbivore 
um, is like a range almost for some omnivores. Um, we do have true herbivores like deer that will only ever eat vegetation and will not eat other meat. Um, but then we kind of have a range where foxes will eat majority, majority of meat, but will eat some fruits and veggies. Um, then we have bear, which actually eat a majority of fruits, veggies, nuts, um, all of that sort, and then a little bit of meat as well. Um, so we can kind of, there, there's more of a range between them. Um, and then this is a deer skull. This is what I was just talking about. You can tell that they are a uh, herbivore. They do have all of these flat grinding molars. They are a little rough when they're born, but you can also tell their age based on the um, grinding of their teeth. Um, if they're more flat, they're usually, they're older. Um, and they have these little incisors up here as well. Um, so I don't know if you guys know the topic of this slide. I know it's going to be a hard one, um, but this one is asking you to please ride roller coasters. No, I'm kidding. It's please do not feed wildlife. Um, and we ask this of you. Um, we don't want you to feed wildlife and we don't want you to feed your pets outside. Bird feeders are okay during the winter when everything's, um, kind of the, all the bears are uh, hibernating or in torpor for the season. Um, it is okay to put bird feeders out then, but we ask you to take them up during the summer. And then we ask that you don't feed your pets outside. And this is because you're not only attracting um, uh, foxes and raccoons and possums, you're also attracting bear. We've got 14,000 in the state. And um, although you might think it's super cool that one shows up in your backyard, your little old lady neighbor down the road might not. And if he's stopping at your house, he's also checking out all your neighbor stuff too to see what they got. Um, so if you leave something outside and then your neighbor sees him, calls us, we'll have to come tranquilize the bear, put him to sleep, relocate them, but they have a really good homing sense. They have a really good instinct for where home is. They're gonna come back um, if they can. And if they do, we get another call. Um, eventually we'll just have to put the animal down because it's become a nuisance animal and we don't have the resources to keep relocating this one of 14,000 bear all the way across the state. Um, so it is kind of sad. So we do ask that you don't feed your wildlife. Um, so here's a food chain. So the energy is going to come from the sun to our primary producer. And then it's gonna be eaten by the grasshopper, who's eaten by the bird, who's eaten by the snake, who's eaten by the owl, who dies, who feeds his energy in the mushrooms, and then it, the cycle continues. So this is a food chain, but they get more complicated than this. We get food webs. So these food webs, they're interactive. So this is a wolf, and I don't know why it doesn't have a line from the deer to the wolf, because the wolf will eat the deer. It'll eat the groundhog. They'll eat the squirrels. It'll eat, um, it'll eat birds, sure. It'll eat all of these critters. Um, and this energy is constantly moving throughout because when they get old and they die, they go back to the soil, the plants use that nutrients grow back. Um, so we do call this a closed system, even though we do get energy from the sun from an outside source, we still call it a closed system. But it's really important that we keep this all flowing equally. When we remove one of these links, it becomes a problem. And I've got a little video to show you guys a little bit why. And it's short. Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, 
but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers and provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes, and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less Erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. All right, so that was a little bit about um, why it's so important that we make sure that we maintain these food webs and our keystone species. Um, so just because everyone hunted wolves to extinction, it literally changed the entire ecosystem. And when we added them back, even though they were hunting other animals, it was still extremely important for the health of the environment. Um, so I am almost done. I know it is almost time. So here's a couple more resources. Um, I highly suggest watching this documentary if you're interested in this type. It is called Stars in the Sky. It's on Netflix. It is, it's a, the guy from Meat Eater, Steve Rinella, um, is who this is about. Um, it's, he's a hunter and it talks about the controversy between hunting and people who see hunting as a negative source. Um, and it talks about all the benefits of hunting, the control of the population, um, and how I like to describe it and of why hunting is so beneficial is carrying capacity. So I've got this box that I am in. This is my Ashley box. All my meals come to this box, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. If I, I have to share my box and I only get this much or even this much. And I have five other people I have to share it with now in this box, but this box still only gets breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
someone's going hungry. We're not all getting the same amount of resources. Someone's going hungry. And I guarantee it's them because I get hungry. Um, so not all of our population of the box of all six of us will be able to be sustained. So when you hunt a population for positive resources to feed your family for sport, to donate that food to uh, local food shelters, all of that, it actually provides a healthy environment where I am getting all my resources that I need for me. Um, so even though I, I don't have any competition anymore, so it makes for a healthy environment. Um, so that's why controlling uh, the populations with hunting is super beneficial. And that's why we have hunting season for big game species. Um, another good resource is gonna be our um, site. I have it pulled up here. Um, if you go here uh, to West Virginia or wbdnr.gov and you go down, uh, we are getting a new website, so it will be easier to manage. Um, and then you go to publications and programming and you go to wildlife diversity publications. We have all of these publications. We have a whole list of mammals here in West Virginia, um, a checklist where you can go try to see these different animals. Um, we have um, field guides. So this is for, oh, that's a checklist. Um, we have field guides for, um, where are they? Uh, neotropical migratory birds. Um, and it shows you all the birds here um, that we've got that actually go to South America um, or Mexico uh, during the winter. And we've got all of these, ooh, um, fishes of West Virginia, we got, oh, this is what I was looking for, I think. Um, we've got all of these different um, programs and just how to's and uh, usually we keep some paper copies in um, house, but this is a really good resource. Um, I will show you one more thing. I know we're almost out of time is going to be the kids zone. Um, so we do have outdoor classrooms that teachers can schedule outdoor classrooms. But for you guys, we also have creature features, which will tell you guys about some different birds and um, animals that we have in West Virginia. We also have Craft Corner, um, which I named after my mother. She used to do Craft Corner. And these are all different summer crafts, winter crafts, and I will change these each year um, in the fall. So these will be changed out soon. So we've got Fork Dandelion and it has everything that you need to know, like your materials needed and what you need to do. Um, and then we've got the Game Center, which are different games. Uh, here's a game on carrying capacity, um, capture the bear, spider web. Um, we have coloring sheets and science activities. Um, a do-it-yourself water filter, a do-it-yourself compost pen, um, why don't frogs freeze, we, how otters stay warm. So all of these different things and all the materials are in here if you need a print for the color sheet for this little guy, it's on here. So these are great resources for you guys to do and have. Um, yeah, there's our website and I'm gonna stop sharing now. And do you guys have any questions for me before we go? This is a little bit of a quiet group. I appreciate you guys though for coming to my class. I Thanks so much, fun. Ashley. That was really interesting. A lot of good information, a lot of great pictures. Anybody have yeah. any questions before we end our session? From either of the Eli's. <laughs>